Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew O'Neill. I'm a professor of political science and uh, dean of research in the Griffith University Business School. And it's my great pleasure this evening to be moderating uh, a conversation with uh, Scott Snyder and uh, Do Yon Kim uh, on the theme of security on the Korean Peninsula, where to after the Pyeongchang Olympics. And I'll tell you a little bit about Scott and Duyon shortly, but before I do, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal on Torres and Torres Strait Islander people. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Mr. Derek Brown, uh, the State Director of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Queensland, uh, Ms. Uh, Keiko Yanai, uh, Director General, uh, sorry, Consul General, of the uh, Consulate of, uh, General of, of uh, Japan in Brisbane, uh, Mr. Yuuchi Aramori, uh, Deputy Consul General uh, of the Consulate General of Japan in, in Brisbane, welcome, and uh, Captain Caspar Cooper, who's Honorary Consul of the Honorary Consulate of the Netherlands in, in Brisbane, welcome uh, one and all. Today, the Korean Peninsula sits on a knife edge. North Korea's weapons of mass destruction program has accelerated since 2011 under the leadership of Kim Jong-un. And we have witnessed, and we have a president in the White House who, more than any other US leader since 1950, is seriously contemplating the prospect of military action against North Korea. Threaded through this is a persistent uncertainty about the future of inter-Korean relations and the unprecedented humanitarian, economic and geopolitical consequences of any conflict on the peninsula. For ordinary Koreans on both sides of the 38th parallel, the risk of a conflict that would eclipse by an order of magnitude the 1950-53 war is an existential question. And yet, we continue to witness apparent progress towards the Pam and Jom inter-Korean summit next month, which by the way is a week, less than a week away, and more spectacularly, a Donald Trump Kim Jong-un summit in May. Photos released today of Kim Jong-un and his wife, Ri uh, Sol Ju, visiting Beijing to, visit, uh, to meet with uh, Xi Jinping and other senior Chinese officials provides further evidence that we are well and truly heading into uncharted territory. It would seem that the conventional rule book for assessing how the Korean Peninsula will evolve in future is being rewritten. We're on a knife edge, but we might also be on the edge of something historically pathbreaking in, in uh, historically pathbreaking in breaking uh, a, a strategic deadlock that up until recently seemed insoluble. Tonight, it's my great pleasure and privilege to be moderating a discussion with two of the world's leading career experts. Scott Snyder and Do Yon Kim have been centrally involved this week in a series of workshops and policy roundtables here in Brisbane and in Canberra with colleagues from ANU, Griffith and Hancock University. Our roadshow, as it's become known, has been supported by the Australia Career Foundation and I would like to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues in DFAT who have supported this week's activities, including tonight's Events and before I um, before I invite uh, Scott and uh, uh, Duyon to uh, provide a, a ten a five to ten minute overview before we get into discussion, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Scott and Duyon. Scott Snyder is a senior fellow for Korean Studies, uh, Korea Studies, and director of the program on U.S. Korea policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Scott is the author of a wide variety of publications, including. South Korea at the Crossroads, Autonomy and Alliance in an Era of Rival Powers, his most recent book published this year. China's Rise in the Two Koreas, Politics, Economics and Security. And uh, one of uh, a very well-known book uh, uh, on North Korea um, entitled Negotiating on the Edge, North Korean Negotiating Behaviour, uh, published in 1999. Scott's the author of the uh, Japan-South Korea Identity Clash with Brad Glossaman. Uh, and prior to joining the Council on Foreign Relations, Scott was a senior associate in the International Relations Program of the Asia Foundation, where uh, he founded and directed the Center for US Korea Policy and served as the Asia Foundation's representative in Korea from 2000 to 2004. 
Do Yon Kim is a visiting senior fellow at the Korea Peninsula Future Forum, a nonpartisan think tank based in Seoul, founded and run by former South Korean National Security Advisor Chun Young Woo, and uh, also a columnist for uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Kim specialises in uh, the two, uh, sorry, Do Yon specialises in the two Koreas, nuclear non-proliferation, East Asian relations, US nuclear policy, uh, and arms control and security. Do Yon was associate in the nuclear policy in Asia programs at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and previously a senior fellow and deputy director of non-proliferation at the Center for Arms Control and non-proliferation uh, in Washington, D.C. In her first career, Do Yon served as the Foreign Ministry Correspondent and Unification Ministry Correspondent for South Korea's uh, uh, Arirang TV News, covering the six-party talks, North Korea, South Korean foreign policy, and many other issues. Um, so look, that's where I'm going to leave uh, my uh, introduction, and I'm going to start by handing over to Scott for okay. some uh, reflections on the Korean Peninsula. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andrew, and it's a real pleasure to be here in Brisbane and to be at, uh, um, uh, at the invitation of Griffith University. Uh, and, um, you know, I was really struck uh, in your introduction of the issue uh, by uh, how, on the one hand, we're kind of, it looks like we might, we're certainly at a historic moment in terms of some of the things that are going to unfold over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, and yet, uh, this conflict uh, is such an intractable conflict, uh, going all the way back to the Korean War, 1950 to 53. Uh, and uh, in some ways, uh, when President Trump comes in and says that he's going to solve the North Korea problem, it's really shocking and uh, it makes people worry a little bit, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I thought I might do is to just uh, step back uh, and talk about the intractability aspect, because I I've heard the North Korea problem associated in terms of its difficulty uh, it's been compared to trying to solve the Rubik's Cube. And I think that's probably a good uh, analogy because uh, there's a global, a regional, and a peninsular dimension uh, to this particular conflict. Uh, and uh, this is a, a multi-layered conflict. Uh, and so just briefly, the global dimension, I think, really is about the North Korean nuclear challenge and about the standoff between the United States and North Korea over whether or not North Korea should be allowed to pursue uh, that program. Uh, and it is certainly uh, the issue that has drawn attention in terms of the war of words that we saw last year between Trump and Kim, uh, as well as uh, the prospect of a bloody nose or the prospect of a, um, a meeting uh, between Trump and Kim. Uh, and it's pretty clear that President Trump, uh, as he approaches this issue, he really wants to pursue uncertainty maximization uh, he's been very effective in terms of trying to, uh, you know, underscore that he can go in many different directions. Uh, but the core of it is really the nuclear dimension. But then, you know, and these levels are interactive, there's also this regional component. Uh, and I think the regional component was highlighted today uh, by Kim Jong-un's visit uh, to meet with Xi Jinping. Because the fact of the matter is that uh, China views a friendly Korean peninsula as essential to its security. Uh, Japan also happens to view uh, a friendly Korean Peninsula as essential to its security. And the United States, through its alliance with Japan uh, and uh, its alliance with South Korea, uh, becomes the primary geopolitical competitor at the regional level uh, that uh, we can see you know, that dimension coming into play. Uh, and then there's also the peninsular dimension. And in a way, this might be the one that it's both the longest standing issue and also the one that gets overlooked uh, because historically the two Koreas have been competitors for legitimacy uh, really since the end of World War II and the formation of separate states on the Korean Peninsula. Um, the idea of an uh, inter-Korean summit, the third one, uh, it challenges the question of whether or not uh, the two Koreas are going to continue to compete or whether or not there might be some kind of, of rapprochement. Uh, and this whole balance of power on the peninsula is really critical because, you know, we know that South Korea is the most powerful. Obviously, Kim Jong-un wants to survive. Uh, both Koreas uh, talk about the desire for unification, but 
act like they would maybe prefer peaceful coexistence. We'll get into all of that. But, uh, you know, those dimensions, basically, they're separate, but they're also interlocking. Uh, and in order to actually solve uh, the issue, I think we're going to have to see progress on each level uh, in kind of like a combination lock. Uh, and we'll see if Trump or Kim uh, can actually solve the combination. Thanks, Scott. That's a really fantastic overview. Do you? Thank you so much, Andrew and Brendan, uh, Griffith University and ANU, and also the, of course, the Asia, the, sorry, the Australia Korea Foundation uh, for this wonderful opportunity to come here and speak to all of you and have this discussion uh, with all of you who are very much interested uh, in this topic. I think Scott's uh, overview is a good segue into my brief remarks on what uh, the recent Winter Olympics, the impact of the Olympics on this current process that we're in and we're, and we're witnessing today. Uh, and as Scott has mentioned, this issue is so complex and there's so many threads and so many layers that I will not be able to give you a one sentence bullet point impact, uh, but I will have to discuss some of the threads uh, that are uh, intertwined in this issue. And one is for South Korean President Moon Jae-in his motivation to drive this current process that we're in, this diplomatic process, uh, seems to be fueled largely by uh, serious concerns that President Trump and his inner circle White House aides might seriously contemplate and take military measures against North Korea to try to solve the nuclear pro problem. Uh, but he also has other motivations and his own personal and presidential agenda of wanting uh, to leave a political legacy, of wanting to be the president who actually uh, sought and achieved inter-Korean reconciliation and peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but I think for the timing of this, uh, it seems to be really that uh, the concern about military, American military action. Uh, for North Korea's part, uh, of course, we can only uh, speculate largely, but based on North Korean past actions over the past 25 years and based on what North Korea has said under uh, Kim Jong-un's leadership, their actions and their statement, statements, uh, it seems pretty evident that uh, Kim Jong-un is driven by wanting to, this, this peace offensive that it's waging towards the South. All of a sudden, these the olive branches, so to speak, I would call them veiled olive branches because I really do believe this is a ploy uh, by the North to try to gain certain concessions, to try to uh, weaken sanctions, to try to weaken future sanctions, to try to split the alliance between the US and South Korea, to try to split even uh, South Koreans between each other, between the conservatives and the, and the liberals within in South Korea, and to also uh, try to make it more difficult by bringing South Korea closer to it and farther away from Washington, uh, to make it more difficult for the White House to take serious or, or military actions against it. Uh, so I do see this as a ploy because it's also, this is, for the North, This these are familiar moves in the same old game that we've seen in the past of cycles of provocation, then cycles of what seems to appear to be diplomacy in their um, apparent uh, moves or desires for, uh, for diplomacy, which really ha have been aimed at gaining uh, some concessions uh, that the North wants, uh, and also to buy time, frankly, to, to continue to develop uh, their nuclear arsenal. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, it's the, the next few weeks and months, you know, as, as you said, Andrew, and I, as skeptical as I am about this current process, because we know the motivations of North Korea, uh, and because we've seen this movie so many times before, but at the same time, you know, it, I, there, it, it does present an opportunity uh, for uh, smart negotiators and smart strategists to try to, uh, to achieve more, a more positive outcome uh, in this process, but uh, really, the stakes are high, for especially for the American president. Uh, and to put it frankly, I would think that for the North, 
uh, Kim Jong-un has nothing to lose. If this so-called diplomatic process right now fails, the North still gains because it can continue on its way to continue to develop its nuclear weapons programs. Mm -hmm. uh, but politically for, for Washington and for President Moon, I know we'll discuss this further, uh, the political stakes are high of failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll leave it at that and we can unpack some of these more in the discussion. Thanks, Dion. They're really terrific insights. Um, uh, Scott, if I could turn um, back to you. I mean, I, w those stunning photographs we've, we've seen today of um, Kim Jong-un meeting Xi Jinping and uh, in, in a way coming from left field, uh, but perhaps in another sense we shouldn't be that surprised. I guess it does really raise the question on a lot of people's minds, wh what does North Korea want to get out of the current process? What's, in a sense, what's the end game for, do they have an end game, Pyongyang? Well, I think that uh, North Korea... Um North Korea is led by a preservationist leadership. They want to have regime survival, uh, but they're also guided by a revolutionary ideology. And so I think there is an aspiration uh, on the part of young Kim Jong-un to try to do his best to shift the strategic chessboard in his favor longer term. Uh, and so it's really a question of is he motivated by duress or is he motivated by a perception of opportunity? And frankly, I think it's a combination of the two uh, at this point. The duress right now is really not duress that he is directly experiencing at the current moment so much as it is duress that will continue to build uh, as, in fact, we uh, see uh, the international pressure campaign uh, move into a higher gear. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's sufficient for Kim Jong-un to recognize that he needs to find a way to blunt uh, that campaign and the best way to do it from his perspective is diplomacy with Beijing as a main supplier of North Korea but also uh, what better than a photo opportunity with uh, Trump uh, to potentially derail uh, a maximum pressure campaign against him. So what, what, uh, what do you think um, Kim Jong-un wants exactly from China that the purpose of, of the visit? Do you think there's a strategy underpinning that? I think the strategy with China is to complicate uh, the perceptions of South Korea and the United States. Uh, you know, really the North Korean game has always been to exploit divisions among, among major powers. Uh, the relationship between North Korea and China has been very frayed. Uh, and so that's what made uh, his uh, showing up in Beijing so surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet if he's really gonna engage uh, at a geopolitical level uh, you know, with uh, really the mortal enemy for North Korea is South Korea because it is just so much of a banner of success compared to what has happened in North Korea. Uh, and then also with his ideological, uh, you know, kind of uh, enemy, the one that, the go-to uh, enemy that North Korea can rely on in propaganda campaigns uh, as a way of shoring up internal uh, legitimacy. Uh, you know, and the um, uh, kind of hostile power for decades, you know, then, you know, uh, bringing China in uh, to give him leverage as part of that engagement process, uh, it actually makes sense. Mm. Okay, thanks. Dion, I wanted to sort of turn, turn to you. I, uh, we seem in a way to be inhabiting parallel universes here. On the one hand, we seem to have grounds for optimism with the kind of summit season in Northeast Asia. Um, China, the DPRK, uh, photo opportunity today, um, promise of the inter-Korean summit at Pam and Jom next month, the, um, the kind of gold, the holy grail, if you like, of a US DPRK summit in, in May. And, and yet recent appointments in the Trump administration, here I'm thinking of John Bolton, John Bolton as National Security Advisor and, and also Mike Pompeo as um, Secretary of State succeeding Tillerson, uh, would seem to suggest to outsiders that, um, you know, the U.S. is kind of lining up for uh, military action in, 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 you know, if things go bad. I mean, what's your sense, given the connections you have in, in D.C. Uh, and talking to people there and in Seoul and elsewhere about the prospects for military action? I mean, how, how might this turn out if things do go bad? Well, that really is a concern uh, with this process, and that's part of the reason why some of the, uh, the stakes are high, is the way especially John Bolton has framed the uh, a potential U.S.-North Korea summit in, a late, in his latest interview with RFA. 
and if he's able to have his way with President Trump, uh, he makes it sound like if, North, if Kim Jong-un shows up in a meeting with Trump and Trump asks him a yes or no question, will you denuclearize or not? Will you give up your weapons or not? And if Kim doesn't give him a straight shot yes, the way Bolton has framed it is saying, okay, thank you, goodbye, we'll go on our way with our pressure campaign and, put, and hinting at or implying that uh, military options are, will never be off the table and they're still squarely on the table. And so the concern really is, is that uh, if, if the Trump-Kim summit does not result in the manner, the fashion, and in the way that President Trump and his White House aides want it to go, then they might jump to serious considerations uh, about military measures. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where many on the outside, uh, whether you're scholars and experts and civil society even, you know, so the White House is faced with three broad choices. One is a negotiated settlement, no matter, despite how hard that might be right now. The second would be like a Soviet-style long-term containment isolation, and then that, and the final would be military measures. And so the concern is, is that uh, the Trump administration is entertaining the idea of this per potential diplomacy, this diplo diplomatic angle. But if that doesn't work, you'll just skip over and jump to military measures. And so that, that that's where the concern is. And so I would suspect that. Uh, particularly South Korean President Moon Jae-in, he and his administration would try whatever it can to keep all parties, even Beijing too, to keep all parties locked into this diplomatic process that we're seeing. Uh, and it would really have to take um, not just American civil society, that, that really there are a lot of um, advocates there who are, uh, are lobbying members of Congress and, and the administration not to go the military route, but it's going to have to take uh, an international effort uh, to uh, restrain uh, President Trump and his um, aides who are for military mm -hmm. options. So if we take a step back from that, I mean, um, some of our discussions this week have centred upon, you know, the personal role of, of, of President Trump, you know, the author of The Art of the Deal, someone who prides himself on being able to cut the deal. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if negotiations don't work the first time around, then we'll have a go again. I mean, do you think, um, you know, do, do you think President Trump has the wherewithal to be able to, you know, to, to cut a deal with North Korea? Could we, could we see something that, you know, takes us all by surprise? That's always a possibility. We may be surprised. Uh, he is a self-proclaimed deal maker. And, uh, and in his memoir, his autobiography of The Art of the Deal, uh, he, he outlines his strategy and his, his psychology and logic behind the way he makes deals. Uh, and with the, the uh, financial success that he's had in his business life, perhaps there's a reason to believe he is somewhat of a negotiator, but uh, international politics and diplomatic negotiations are completely different, and these issues are highly complex. Uh, but you know, being the unconventional president that pr he is, uh, and also Kim Jong-un is quite an unconventional too in many, in many aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to um, perhaps think outside the box a little bit and, you know, because it's, pro it's going to happen. President Trump has decided it's going to happen as long as Kim Jong-un shows up at the summit, it's happening. So I think right now, you know, the best thing we can do is try to come up with uh, ideas and recommendations um, to, to try to make it work and mm -hmm. to try to um, help it to succeed even though people like myself are very skeptical, we really don't have a choice. And it's really a choice between this process that it has risks and challenges versus the very dangerous situation we were in last year uh, with all the bluster and the threats. Uh, and so it's really, um, you know, we really need to make the best of what we have right now. Yeah, thanks, Dion. Scott, I wanted to ask you about South Korea because one, one of the things that struck me through the process really leading to this point is the central role of the Moon Jae-in government, and in, you know, in particular, um, the National Security Advisor and the head of the National Intelligence Service, the NIS. And uh, in a way, they have been acting as, in, as an intermediary between uh, Pyongyang and, and the White House. I mean, you know, in a, in a sense, the South Koreans have been quite central up to this point. W what do you think South Korea, what, what, what would be the ideal outcome of this process, you know, broadly defined for, for the Blue House? Yeah. 
Uh, I, Andrew, I'm really <coughs> glad you asked that question because I think that uh, South Korea's role uh, trying to put the U.S. and North Korea together uh, has kind of been underappreciated given the focus on mm -hmm. the idea of uh, President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un actually meeting with each other. Uh, you know, but what we've seen unfold uh, really after the Olympics ended uh, was such a remarkable situation where you had uh, these two South Korean special envoys, uh, Chong uh, and National uh, Intelligence Service Director Sa, go and meet with Kim Jong-un, come back, give a press conference, and later that week go to the White House and actually appear on the front lawn of the White House making an announcement that President Trump had accepted a summit meeting with Kim Jong-un. And yet, you know, everything that we've heard uh, about this potential meeting has come from the South Korean intermediaries, not from the North Koreans or from Trump. Mm. So we've actually got uh, this uh, filter, uh, this effort uh, by the South Korean president to connect the U.S. and DPRK. Mm. And, and really, I think it's pretty simple in some ways what I think South Korea wants to do. Duyon mentioned the concern about uh, military action. Uh, I've actually been doing an informal survey uh, with South Korean colleagues. Uh, who does Trump scare most, Kim Jong-un or Moon Jae-in? Uh, you know, but really, I think what the South Korean president wants to do is to reopen a currently closed pathway to peaceful denuclearization. Mm. Uh, and he needs denuclearization from Kim Jong-un. He needs peaceful from Trump. Uh, and we have to wait and see whether it's possible for this closed road to be reconstructed uh, and built, uh, or whether uh, actually um, Moon Jae-in is going to drive everybody off the cliff, uh, because at present uh, the road is closed, uh, there's not a pathway, uh, and uh, the alternative is a trajectory toward confrontation mm. between the United States and North Korea. Thanks, Scott. You know, the, the conventional uh, wisdom is that North Korea um, is, is absolutely committed to holding on to its nuclear uh, weapons and, and long-range missile inventories, and that, you know, given the fact that it wrote uh, the possession of nuclear weapons into its constitution in 2012, there's zero chance it will give up its, its, its nuclear forces. I want to put it both to you. I mean, do you, do you buy that argument, or do you actually think there's a chance that, that North Korea will... Um, bargain and settle for um, uh, 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 disarmament, and, and if you don't believe that, what what do you think? You know, if you don't buy that that kind of counter argument, what do you think we might see instead in terms of in, in terms of an outcome? So, based on what we've been seeing um, with North Korea's actions for the past twenty five years, uh, does not seem like they would ever give up their nuclear weapons anytime soon. Uh, at the same time, we do have Korea experts, uh, very smart experts, who do claim, who are in the other school of thought of, there's still a chance. It's hard, but there's still a chance. And they revert to, they keep pointing to North Korean statements, which apparently they have, mm. Kim Jong-un has reiterated in his meeting with South Korean envoys in Pyongyang. And that statement is highly conditional, that the North might consider, might consider denuclearization if the military threat is removed. And to them, the military threat is the United States. Is the United States military presence uh, on the Korean Peninsula. It's the United States um, presence and influence in the region. It's the alliance with South Korea. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, if that is true, uh, it will, uh, negotiations have become so much more complicated because of where the North is right now in their uh, nuclear s technological status. So they've, they've developed their, their weapons um, far more than we've expected to. Mm. Uh, and so it'll make it so much harder to uh, try to convince North Korea to negotiate away uh, their nuclear weapons. And frankly, the North Koreans are very skillful negotiators. They know they know America's tricks. Uh, they've got tricks of their own. They know America's strategy and American thinking. Uh, and they've been dealing with the U.S. The same strategists in North Korea have been dealing with America for the past 25 years. Whereas in the U.S., um, 
the democratic system is such where you've get, you have new administrations every four to eight years. Uh, and so you have different people in place and having uh, new people come in and having to learn the, the, the issue from scratch. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's really going to be a tough road ahead. Uh, and I, I would love to be surprised uh, and I would love to be proven wrong, but at this rate, uh, you know, it looks like if any negotiations right now for North Korea currently looks to be that the North would negotiate to keep the nuclear weapons, maybe negotiate some restraint, like limitations, uh, but to still to keep what they have. Mm. Uh, and that's still problematic for um, American allies like South Korea and Japan and other parts mm. of the world. I'm gonna come to the audience in a minute and see, not whether there are, but how many questions there are for Scott and Dion. But before I do, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Scott to address that last question. Okay, well, there's definitely a low probability that Kim Jong-un is gonna be willing to voluntarily give up uh, his weapons. Uh, the military option is the option of last resort, but it is just so costly and so potentially catastrophic that we really need to explore all the alternative measures. Uh, and really, the only pathway that I think makes the most sense uh, given the fact that Kim Jong-un has basically married himself to the nuclear program, uh, is a strategy that actually uses economic pressure in order to induce elite cleavage inside North Korea in ways that bring Kim Jong-un to the realization that if he keeps on going, he's gonna lose his support base. Now, of course, this is a, a regime that, uh, you know, in which uh, uh, political uh, loyalty is paramount. So very challenging to induce elite cleavage. Sanctions is a potential way to do it, but at present, the sanctions regime, I think, is operating more like a hammer and less like a scalpel. Mm. And so if you want to reach inside and induce that kind of elite cleavage, you need to know the economic relationships well enough to manipulate them in ways that generate that kind of division and dissent inside North Korea. I don't know if it's possible for us to do that, but I think it's actually our only uh, um, non-military way out. Mm. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Well, look, the floor is open. Um, if people have questions they'd like to uh, pose to Scott and Dion, please do raise your hand. And um, if, you, if you could say your name and uh, provide a brief question, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, my name's Damien Spry. Um, I spent four years in Seoul at uh, Hanyang Daehyukgyo and also was a broadcaster for a while at TBS um, and had quite a close relationship with the diplomatic and military community while I was there. And I was struck, I, I lived through a couple of you know, missile tests and I was struck the difference between how the international community felt about these things and how local Koreans were, we've seen this all before, you know, they're just behaving badly, then they'll stop behaving badly and they'll want to be rewarded for it. So my first question is, is it different this time around because of the nuclear aspect, because of Trump, and also because of President, uh, President Moon? And also, I guess, more specifically, um, what level of support is there for President Moon's um, actions and his strategy here? And, you know, Korean politics shifts really, really quickly, right? What would it take for suddenly the Korean people to say, no, you, you're going about this the wrong way, or what you're doing is hopeless or pointless? Um, thank you for that question. It's, the short answer to your first question is it's not that different than before in terms of how South Koreans are reacting to this current situation, uh, the seriousness of the security situation. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, for South Koreans, they've seen this so many times and they've lived with this threat for so long that if you walk the streets of Seoul, nobody is hoarding grocery stores to buy water or food or nobody is packing their go bags and masks and uh, but at the same time you know it, it's it's interesting because more South Koreans are more concerned about President Trump than they are about Kim Jong-un I think that says a lot uh, so <laughs> so that's the answer to your first question uh, to your second I'm sorry what was your second question again Levels of political support, right political support yeah so as you can imagine and because you have lived in Seoul um, the opposition of course the opposition party is heavily criticizing um, this current process mm -hmm. currently you know I think to oversimplify and overgeneralize I think there is um, enough support to um, watch and observe the Moon administration give this a shot, 
but your question was what will it take for the public to um, to not support this process and it would really be if you know, because the South Korean public has seen this so many times before, they're very skeptical. So the broader public has, gr has grown increasingly skeptical about both North Korea's sincerity and, uh, and, and seriousness and about how their own government deals with the North. Uh, and so, especially the, uh, the generation that's in their 20s to 30s and 40s, uh, they're very skeptical. And, and what, would, what would take for them to... Um, I guess object more vocally is if they saw their government uh, have to pay exorbitant amounts of money to have, you know, a summit and and to resume uh, into Korean projects that have been uh, broken for a long time. And so to them, that's that's what's important because the South Korean economy today, uh, income disparity, uh, it's very it's hard for college graduates to to find jobs. Uh, and so financial, individual, personal financial prosperity is very important. Uh, and so they don't want to see their government again having to pay for so much for something that <coughs> they may not see any returns of. Scott, do you Scott, want to yeah, I'll just add one thing, uh, and that is, um, you know, we all know that uh, President Moon got 41% of the Korean votes, uh, which is a plurality, uh, in order to become president, but he's currently polling at about 70%. So uh, that means that he's winning support uh, from people beyond his support base, uh, and it also means uh, that if he begins to make missteps, uh, we could see uh, that uh, level of popularity rapidly erode. Uh, and Do Yeon just put her finger on something very important, and that is uh, the question that many South Koreans are probably asking, where do we want our president to spend political capital? And one critical choice is between um, North Korea and the domestic economy. And I would say that especially for uh, uh, voters in their 20s, uh, they, uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, how they respond to the idea uh, that uh, the political capital should be spent on trying to draw Kim Jong-un into some kind of uh, peace process. And just to add one more is for the South Korean public, because they've seen the past aggressive administrations try this type of approach, this diplomatic approach offering more reduced uh, carrots to try to listen to come back with um, a genuine commitment that North Korea would abandon their nuclear weapons. And I, I, the South Korean populated public, they know very well that the North will only deal with the United States on the nuclear issue, but still they, they see their government as having a role, mm -hmm. a voice in the state that directs the issue. And so for them, they're going to be looking out on, on the nuclear front as well. Good. Thank you. Um, Um, one thing that worries me is that uh, we've got this summit coming up. And I tend to think that there's too much of an expectation. Now, I'm a mediator myself, on, not on that basis, but I know when the parties come in with sort of fixed positions, th that's what you've got to do. You've got to break the positions into, into interests. And I do fear, especially from the United States point of view, that there seems to be a position, an inflexible position, that they think that they have the power and balance, which to a certain extent they do. <coughs> but I'll make the point that North Korea is not Grenada. Basically, comment on that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'll start. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of volatility between here and there. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the United States and North Korea uh, pull out at least once before they actually get to a meeting between, um, you know, Moon uh, and Trump. Uh, and yes, there's a lot of positioning uh, there. It's going to be very, actually, this is going to be a little bit weird uh, from a U.S. perspective because, you know, this type of meeting uh, on the front end of a process uh, we like to have our presidents be closers, uh, but here he is opening a process, and really you have to go back to Reagan and Gorbachev and Reykjavik 
uh, before you can, you know, come to a kind of prior uh, precedent for thinking about, you know, how this type of meeting could go. Mm. That's an amazing analogy, Reagan and Reykjavik, yeah. Forgive me, I, I, was, I was consumed with technological difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> North Korea is not Grenada, um, and the concern I think is if is if people come in, if if Trump and Kim come in with fixed positions, then it's it's going to be very difficult to reach a kind of middle a middle ground in in the initial negotiations. Yes, and so uh, like uh, Scott said, uh, you know, tr President Trump has basically flipped the order of. Thank you. North uh, Korean microphones. Oh, I know. They're, <laughs> they're tampering with their microphones. Um, President Trump has approached this in a very unconventional uh, manner, which is basically to flip the order, to have a summit first, and then um, perhaps uh, negotiations follow after. Uh, and you know, as, as risky as it can be, um, it, it, it's somewhat it somewhat makes sense from, I guess, President Trump's psychology, if we can say that, or if we can understand his psychology at all. Uh, but it really comes from more of a, a real estate tycoon approach of having the heads come together and um, seal the big picture deal and then, then having your staff finish mm. it off with mm. the details. Mm. Uh, and so uh, I can surely imagine that both sides will come into the meeting uh, with firm opening positions, uh, but I would, I would like to see, and I would hope that um, the opportunity here is for the, U the, the President of the United States and the leader of North Korea for the first time having a direct conversation, clarifying each other's positions, and trying to understand more accurately how the other is thinking on these issues and what their objectives are. Mm. Because until now, they've been trying to read each other through public statements, mm. through posturing, mm. and, real, and public statements really, they're very, they're, a lot of them are very veiled, and a lot mm. of them cater to, cater to their domestic audiences, mm. and they don't reveal the full picture or the full range of opportunities. And so uh, I think the opportunity that both sides should take, at the very least, is to clarify uh, each other's positions, to try to come to an understanding of where each other is coming from, and then, mm. and then from there, um, hopefully, iron mm. out the details, which will be very difficult. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it, because Donald Trump does pride himself above all else as throwing the rule book out the window when it comes to, certainly, his approach to international politics. Okay that for him is a kind of mirror image in a way of, of his approach to domestic politics. Um, so the dynamic will be interesting. So there were questions, a lot of questions. So, um, sorry, right up the back, because the back's often neglected at these sorts of things. So. Thanks. Uh, Ross, with, a <coughs> with the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, um, one of the calls that the North Korean government has been making is for the, the massive exercises which the United States and South Korea and I think Japan run in that region maybe every year. Do you see that as a bargaining chip that, that, I, that both Trump may give way on in some sense and also whether the South Korean government would itself be willing to reduce some of those exercises that are run each year? I'd like to go first. Yeah, well, the... Um so uh, that actually has been the, at the core of a Chinese proposal uh, that uh, had pre-existed some of this. Uh, basically the idea that North Korea could trade missile and nuclear tests uh, restraint uh, for uh, restraint in terms of conducting exercises uh, between the U.S. and South Korea. Uh, I think that the idea of a, a direct trade-off between those two has been a non-starter, uh, primarily because the missile and nuclear tests that North Korea has been doing have been um, uh, sanctioned by the UN Security Council uh, and the US South Korea exercises are part of preparations in order to be ready uh, in case there is some kind of North Korean you know uh, incident uh, can those exercises be reduced in scope or, or made uh, less uh, threatening um, I would say that that absolutely could be a part of some kind of process. Uh, Trump actually, it's hard to say exactly how he would feel about that. He may be even more flexible than many in the national security establishment mm -hmm. uh, on that particular issue, mm -hmm. uh, which probably provides some with an even greater source of concern. 
uh, about the idea of Trump going and you know having this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that's the picture. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree that um, the scope and the intensity and some of the threatening elements that have been added on in recent years can be taken off, some of the more threatening elements, and that's what we call the deployment of strategic assets to the peninsula. Um, and supposedly we've actually done that, or planning on doing that this time in the upcoming exercises. They're trying to, they're planning on not deploying these strategic assets to the region for these exercises, and that's um, being perceived as a gesture on the part of the allies, a, more of a goodwill or confidence building gesture. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the North, as, as Scott said, the North is not supposed to be testing anyway, and they're not supposed to be making nuclear weapons anyway. Uh, and these drills are defensive in nature. And so to, for the allies to completely halt or cancel um, these exercises would be like dropping a shield mm. before a drawn sword. So if the allies drop their shield, well, the North still has their sword drawn pointed straight at South Korea, Japan, and the United States because they still have their nuclear weapons capability. Uh, and so that, in that sense, um, you know, I, I also am of the view that I'm, I'm completely opposed to having that trade-off of the military exercises for some sort of um, halt in their nuclear missile testing. It's an interesting point you raised, Scott, you know, that the US national security community um, may be concerned about any sort of off-the-cuff commitments that, that Trump makes at the meeting that they will then be forced to implement. Um, so it's, it's an interesting angle, actually. Please. Yes. Sir. Thank you. James O'Neill, uh, unrelated to Andrew. No, no, no <laughs> relation. <huh? laughs> Late last year, the Chinese <coughs> government made, issued a statement which in effect said, if North Korea unilaterally attacks another country, they're on their own. But if North Korea is attacked, then it'll be treated as an attack upon China. Given that reality, and assuming that even Trump and Bolton aren't stupid enough to want a war with China, doesn't that realistically leave only some form of negotiated settlement, of which at least one option would be the Americans getting out of what isn't their own backyard? Who wants to have a go at that? Well, it certainly underscores uh, the risks associated with military conflict, but I wouldn't at all uh, presume that it doesn't mean that it's not possible. In fact, the problem that we have is, uh, you know, just stepping back, the driver for this has been, you know, North Korea's quest for an ability uh, to strike the United States directly, potentially with a nuclear capability. The U.S. is going to reject that level of vulnerability to Kim Jong-un. Uh, and uh, once Kim Jong-un attains that capability, it raises levels of uncertainty about what North Korea is doing. Uh, and so it means that you know, if there's a satellite flying over uh, North Korea uh, and they see an ICBM being prepared for launch, um, you know, it could be a nuclear warhead or it could be a paper mache image of Kim Jong-un the United States government is probably not going to care. The president is going to be called and asked to make a decision. And so that's where the you know, uncertainty and the risks of miscalculation mm -hmm. you know, go way up. And you know, in the history of our world, we've seen a lot of cases where people back into conflicts uh, as a result of that kind of accidental miscalculation. Mm. And in inadvertent escalation in some cases. Do you? Right. And, <coughs> and the, the hope would be that you know, the, the Trump administration would consider other pressure tactics and options other than the military option um, for denuclearization. But the way they're publicly framing the issue, uh, it sounds like they think a quick fix or a quicker fix is to to um, eliminate um, the North Korean nuclear stockpile our arsenal with force and and your 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 logic is absolutely correct it's just we're it's very unclear um it's hard to be sure what is actually in the minds of um president trump and his his closest aides in the white house and now with um john bolton as national security advisor and we've heard 
President Trump on two major mm. occasions, one a speech at the South Korean National Assembly and then other at his own State of the Union address, talk about peace through strength. Uh, and that's a, a very scary comment um, to be making because that implies that they're more than willing to consider um, hard power and, and the use of force to try to so-called fix problems in the world. For long-term Korea watchers, North Korea has always been the joker in the pack in terms of the unpredictability of outcomes, but increasingly the US is seen as the confounding variable in you know, charting what's going to happen going forward, which is deeply ironic in many, in many respects. We've got time for one more question. So, David, right up the bat. We hear, we hear about uh, uh, the possibility of Seoul and of, of Tokyo going nuclear because of the North Korean threat. What, do you, what would it, you think would, it would take for this to, t to happen? What, what sort of provocations would it take? That's an easy one to answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the, the debate in South Korea and in Japan you know, has been driven by continued North Korean uh, expansion of its capabilities. Uh, and uh, you know the public attitudes in South Korea, you've got over 60% of people who are for uh, acquiring a, a nuclear capability. Um, and so you know, I think that the logic, uh, the complexity and the logic really is that from a U.S. perspective, um, we want to provide extended deterrence. We want the North Koreans to believe that it's credible. Um, even uh, to the extent of accepting the idea that we would be prepared to defend Seoul in the same way we would defend San Francisco. Uh, but if you're in South Korea, suddenly you're looking at the second nuclear age and you're thinking, well, you know, India and Pakistan both have nukes, we need to have a capability. Uh, and that's a logic, and uh, it's a logic that the U.S. is trying to grapple with and that South Korea is also trying to grapple with that, um, is definitely, uh, I think, a moving piece in this picture uh, at mm -hmm. this time. Do you? Yeah, and I would echo um, Scott's comments. Continued uh, nuclear, not only provocations, but advancements, technological advancements and capabilities. Um, the perce perceptions or belief that Washington and Beijing uh, are not proactively trying to solve the problem, because for South Korea and Japan, Resolution of the nuclear issue means no nuclear weapons in North Korea. It doesn't mean just freezing it. It doesn't mean just capping it. It just means no nukes. Uh, and so that was a main, a major concern actually over the past 25 mm -hmm. years when, quite frankly, the, the North Korea issue was really on the back burner, on and off the back shelf in all American administrations. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we, we are, the North Korean issue is at the front burner, is at the front end, at the, in, in the president of the United States' mind, and he talks about it constant, almost on a daily basis. So for the first time, it's there, it's front and center. And so it, that brings relief to um, South Koreans and J J Japanese because the American president is paying that much attention to it. But the problem and the concern is President Trump talks about it, a, a solution in a um, and not in a peaceful manner. Uh, and so that's a scary component for, for South Korea uh, and Japan. And also the last point that Scott mentioned, if, if South Korea and Japan felt like they were not being protected, sufficiently protected by the United States, if they believed and felt that um, the United States would abandon its allies to protect its own homeland, uh, then that would be, those would be incentives for them to be more tempted to go nuclear themselves. Thanks, Dion. Well, it's my um, melancholy duty to bring um, tonight's conversation to, to a close. And, you know, tonight has really been a capstone uh, of a week that began on Monday morning uh, in Canberra with uh, a speech from the Secretary, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Francis Adamson, to open our, our first workshop at ANU. Uh, we had a rousing speech that evening from former Foreign Minister and ANU Chancellor Gareth Evans. Uh, we had some great policy roundtables uh, in Canberra yesterday, and, and today we've had uh, what I think has been a, been a wonderful uh, workshop here in Brisbane uh, to be capped off tonight, as I say, by, by a really insightful conversation. And I'd like, I'd like to thank Scott and, and Dion for, for this evening, and I'd, I'd like you to, to invite all of you to join me in thanking them in, tr in the tr traditional way. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrew. And some... I don't know what are in these gifts, but I am reliably informed they are priceless. So... <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>